Let me ask you about OpenAI O1. What do you think is the role of that kind of test time compute system in programming? I think test time compute is really, really interesting. So there's been the pre-training regime, which will kind of, as you scale up the amount of data and the size of your model, get you better and better performance, both on loss and then on downstream benchmarks um, and just general performance when you use it for coding or, 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 or other tasks. Um, we're starting to hit uh, a bit of a data wall, meaning it's going to be hard to continue scaling up this regime. And so scaling up ten t test time compute is an interesting way of now, you know, increasing the number of inference time flops that we use, but still getting like, uh, like, yeah, as you increase the number of flops you use inference time, getting corresponding uh, improvements in, in the performance of these models. Traditionally, we just had to literally train a bigger model that always uses, uh, that always used that many more flops. But now we could perhaps use the same size model um, and run it for longer to be able to get uh, a, an answer at the quality of a much larger model. And so the really interesting thing I like about this is there are some problems that perhaps require 100 trillion parameter model intelligence trained on 100 trillion tokens. Um, but that's like maybe 1%, maybe like 0.1% of all queries. So are you going to spend all of this effort, all of this compute training a model uh, that costs that much and then run it so infrequently? It feels completely wasteful when instead you get the model that can, that is, that you, you train the model that is capable of doing the 99.9% .9 of queries. And then you have a way of inference time running it longer for those few people that really, really want max intelligence. How do you figure out which problem requires what level of intelligence? Is that possible to dynamically figure out when to use GPT 4, when to use, like when to use a small model and when you need the, the O1? <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's that's an open research problem, certainly. Uh, I don't think anyone's actually cracked this model routing problem quite well. Uh, we'd like to. We, we have like kind of Im initial implementations of this for things, for something like cursor tab. Um, but at the level of like bet going between 4.0 sonnet to 0.1, uh, it's a bit trickier. Perhaps like th there's also a question of like what level of intelligence do you need to determine if the thing is... Uh, Oh, too hard for the, for the the four level model. Maybe you need the O one level model. Um, it, it's really unclear. But but you mentioned this, so there's a there's a there's a pre training process, then there's pro, post training, and then there's like test time compute. Mm -hmm. That fair to sort of separate. Where's the biggest gains? Um, well, it, it's weird because like test time compute, there's like a whole training strategy needed to get test time to compute to work. And the really the other really weird thing about this is no one like outside of the big labs and maybe even just open ai no one really knows how it works like there have been some really interesting papers that uh show hints of what they might be doing and so it, perhaps they're doing something with tree search using process reward models but yeah it just i think the issue is we don't quite know exactly what it looks like. So it would be hard to kind of comment on like where it fits in. I would, I would put it in post training, but maybe like the compute spent for this kind of, for getting test time compute to work for a model is going to dwarf pre-training eventually. So we don't even know if O1 is using just like chain of thought RL. We don't know how they're using any of these. We don't know anything. It's fun to speculate. <laughs> <laughs> Like if you were to uh, build a competing model, what would you do? Yeah. So one thing to do would be, I think you probably need to train a process reward model, which is, so maybe we can get into reward models and outcome reward models versus process reward models. Outcome reward models are the kind of traditional reward models that people are trained for these for, for language models, language modeling. And it's just looking at the final thing. So if you're doing some math problem, let's look at that final thing you've done, everything. And let's assign a grade to it. How likely we think, uh, like, what's the reward for this, this this outcome? Process reward models instead try to grade the chain of thought. And so OpenAI had some preliminary paper on this, I think, uh, last summer, where they use human labelers to get this pretty large, several hundred thousand data set of grading chains of thought. Um, Ultimately, it feels like uh, I haven't seen anything interesting in, in the ways that people use process reward models outside of just using it as a means of uh, affecting how we choose between a bunch of samples. So like what people do, 
uh, in all these papers is they sample a bunch of outputs from the language model and then use the process reward models to grade uh, all those generations alongside maybe some other heuristics and then use that to choose the best answer. The really interesting thing that people think might work and people want to work is tree search with these process reward models because if you really can grade every single step of the chain of thought, then you can kind of branch out and you know explore multiple paths of this chain of thought and then use these process reward models to evaluate how good is this branch that you're taking. Yeah, when the, when the quality of the branch is somehow strongly correlated with the quality of the outcome at the very end. So like you have a good model of knowing which branch to take. So not just this in the short term, and like in the long term. Yeah. And like the interesting work that I think has been done is figuring out how to properly train the process or the interesting work that has been open sourced and people I think uh, talk about is uh, how to train the process reward models, um, maybe in a more automated way. Um, I, I could be wrong here, could not be mentioning some papers. I haven't seen anything super uh, that seems to work really well for using the process reward models creatively to do tree search and code. Um, this is kind of an AI safety, maybe a bit of a philosophy question. So OpenAI says that they're hiding the chain of thought from the user. And they've said that that was a difficult decision to make. They, instead of showing the chain of thought, they're asking the model to summarize the chain of thought. They're also in the background saying they're going to monitor the chain of thought to make sure the model is not trying to manipulate the user, which is a fascinating possibility. Mm -hmm. But anyway, what do you think about hiding the chain of thought? One consideration for OpenAI, and this is completely speculative, could be that they want to make it hard for people to distill these capabilities out of their model. It might actually be easier if you had access to that hidden chain of thought uh, to replicate the technology. Because um, that's pretty important data, like seeing seeing the steps that the model took to get to the final result. So you could probably train on that also. And there was sort of a mirror situation with this, with some of the large language model providers, and also this is speculation, but um, some of these APIs um, used to offer easy access to log probabilities for all the tokens that they're generating, um, and also log probabilities over the prompt tokens. And then some of these APIs took those away. Uh, and again, complete speculation, but... Um, one of the thoughts is that the the reason those were taken away is if you have access to log probabilities, um, similar to this hidden chain of thought, that can give you even more information to to try and distill these capabilities out of the APIs, out of these biggest models, into models you control. As an asterisk on also the the previous discussion about uh, us integrating O1, I think that we're still learning how to use this model. So we made O1 available in Cursor because. Like we were, when we got the model, we were really interested in trying it out. I think a lot of programmers are going to be interested in trying it out. But um, uh, O1 is not part of the default cursor experience in any way up. Um, and we still haven't found a way to get integrated into an edit in, uh, into the editor in a way that we, we, we reach for sort of, you know, every hour, maybe even every day. And so I think that the jury's still out on how to, how to use the model. Um, and uh, I, we haven't seen examples yet of of people releasing things where it seems really clear, like, oh, that's that's like now the use case. Um, the obvious one to, to turn to is maybe this can make it easier for you to have these background things running, right? To have these models in loops, to have these models be agentic. Um, but we're still um, still discovering. To be clear, we have ideas. We just need to we need to try and get something incredibly useful before we, we put it out there. But it has these significant limitations, like even like barring capabilities, uh, it does not stream. And that means it's really, really painful to use for things where you want to supervise the output. Um, and instead you're just waiting for the wall of text to show up. Um, also, it, it does feel like the early innings of test time compute and search where it's just like a very, very much a V0. Um, and there's so many things that like, don't feel quite right. And I suspect um, in parallel to people increasing uh, the amount of pre-training data and the size of the models in pre-training and finding tricks there, you'll now have this other thread of getting search to work better and better.